Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters, where I live stream every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, unless otherwise noted. We've been doing these live streams for several years on Sunday mornings. Um, so for those that are new, good morning. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world how to empower the lives of animals and the people that work for them and the people that work with them. Um, so we specialize in applied behavior analysis, understanding behavior, uh, using BF Skinner's laws of behavior um, and positive reinforcement. We do that with several different species of animals. Um, we like to focus on exotics and we help people understand behavior through working with different species of animals. Um, you can find out more about what we do on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. You can also email me at laura at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, I answer each and every email. Sometimes it takes me some time to get to them, but bear with me uh, because we do spend a lot of our time educating others through the events and the workshops we have, through our online memberships, um, our online learning programs, uh, which you're going to see some changes coming to those um, in the very near future. So good morning, everybody. Happy Memorial Day. Um, if you want to stay in touch with us, you can join our email newsletter list, which you can find right here on our Facebook page, or you can find on our website. And it is in our email newsletters where we send out animal behavior training and enrichment tips. Um, sorry about that. Um, and we also have our workshops. So we have a full week or a full summer of workshops. These workshops sell out quickly. Um, we have three different zoo workshops coming up and you can find out more about those workshops right here by clicking on this link or going to our website and clicking on events. Um, so today is a Q and A. I try to revolve the topic around coffee with the critters between animal behavior, training, enrichment, Q and A's, um, showing clips of different things I'm working on training. There I am. Sorry. <laughs> There's a lot going on on my screen, and sometimes I accidentally hit the wrong button and take myself off the screen. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and post them. I'm happy to address them. Uh, but until I see a question, I will fill you in on what I'm working on right now, which we have a lot going on. Um, I'm working on several different things, but... Last Sunday, we didn't have a coffee with the critters because it was Rico's 19th birthday. And we celebrated that by having um, a friends and family gathering at the Animal Behavior Center where the volunteers and employees got the opportunity to bring in their friends and family and see what we do. Um, good morning, Tim, Eva, Nicole, Bobby, Debbie, Therese, everybody. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Um, that was a lot of fun. So it's it's nice to have the friends and family come in so they can see exactly what we do and what we're about at the Animal Behavior Center because we're not open to the public. Um, a couple different things we're working on and we're showing this in our level two membership. We started our wolf training last week and um, you will see me working heavily with Fiona and Smokey Joe, um, two timber wolves. And what we're focusing on right now with them is this is their catch cage. Um, behavior doesn't lie. 
I don't want to say that they're afraid of their catch cage. What, how do you put afraid into observable, measurable behavior? Um, they freely walk in and out of their catch cage into the right where the black wolf is. There is a door that comes down to lock them in. So when the keepers have to go in and um, clean or feed, um, what happens is they freely walk in and out of there. Um, what happens is if you walk near the latch to shut that door, they bolt out. So this is learned behavior from past experiences. And I don't know how people have been interacting with them, but I was like, that's going to be my first thing. I train these two wolves. And I don't know if you can see Fiona. She's right there beside me in the catch cage. Um, she's the lighter colored wolf and Smokey Joe not coming in at all. So I worked with them um, and we're live streaming this in our level two membership to show how to counter condition behavior, how to work with an animal that's showing signs of fear. Um, and Fiona is now in. And as soon as Coffee with the Critters is done today, that's exactly where I'm headed. Um, Fiona is in, but we still have some work to do. So if you'd like to see more about what we're doing there, take a look at our level two membership. You can find it on our website under memberships. Um, this is something else I've been working on that I haven't told anybody I'm working on. Um, some of the volunteers and employees at the center know I'm working on it. And this is teaching the Hyacinth Macaws a voluntary nail trim. Um, I was using the clippers. And then the other day I just said, you know what? I'm going to switch to the Dremel. And um, they're now allowing me just the beginning stages of um, starting to touch their nails with the Dremel. So when you're doing behaviors such as this, like um, training for a voluntary nail trim, um, there's several things that go into it. And a series of chaining behaviors. So you've got to get them to station. You've got to get them ready for that impact. When you're working with a Dremel, um, if the animal's not used to change, not used to new things coming in the environment, you have to get them comfortable with the sight of the Dremel, the sound of the Dremel, the light on the Dremel, um, how it feels when that Dremel touches their nails. Um, so that's what we're working on. Um, Eva has a question. I have a green wing macaw that chews on his chest. He's not self mutilating. I've had him checked by the vet. He's not damaging feather follicles. Suggestions for redirecting this behavior. And Eva, I know you just joined level two. Um, and then level two, our online annual membership also comes with, um, free consultations. So you're asking a very broad question and this depends. So a lot, I see a lot of, um, it's good that you went to the veteran avian vet first to rule that out, that it's not a medical issue. But when I see a lot of abnormal repetitive behaviors, uh, self injurious behaviors, um, mutilating behaviors, feather destructive behaviors, most of the time, a, a lot of time, it's behavior related, um, but it's good to get the medical ruled out in the beginning. Um, so then you can focus on putting together a behavior modification plan. When I'm working with something such as this, I observe, first of all, um, rule out that it's not nutrition. And we're going to be talking about nutrition towards the end of this live stream. Rule out that it's not a nutrition issue. Um, and then you can focus on the behavior, ruling out the medical, the nutrition, then you can focus on the behavior. Um, you try to identify what the reinforcer is behind the undesired behavior in the first place, but you obviously don't know because that's why you're asking me. And this is what I do in my consultations. We'll dig into it. We'll find out what, why is this undesired behavior happening? When does the undesired behavior happening? What other desirable behaviors does the animal already know how to do? Because in order to change a behavior, you need to replace it with another behavior. 
um, the longer an undesired behavior continues to happen, you're building on that history of reinforcement. And when I start working with an undesired behavior, um, if I have the opportunity, I change it immediately. Um, sometimes these animals come to me and you can, you can, there's cues that let you know how long this behavior has been happening. Um, like I said, the longer the undesired behavior happens, the longer it's going to take you to change it. But in my experience, it doesn't take near as long to change it as it did for the animal to learn it in the first place. So your green wing is showing signs of feather destruct destructive behaviors. Um, what replacement behavior do you want it to do instead? And a lot of times people say anything. I'm like, be careful with that because there's a lot of undesired anythings out there. Um, and this is why foraging is part of every part of our behavior modification plan because it is it teaches that animal that replacement behavior um, in addition to training. So studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it is the animal's preferred form of enrichment, but we can't be training all the time. This is why I do, I provide other things such as uh, foraging, aviaries, um, to help with those replacement behaviors. So you need to focus on what do you want the, the animal to do instead. Good morning, Lisa. Um, and start replacing that. And Eva, get in touch with me. We can get a um, online consultation scheduled in level two um, soon, and we can start putting this to work. All right, because I need a lot more information from you. Um, all right, so thank you for your question, Eva. Um, some other things that we're working on, and these are things you can work on as well, Eva. These can be replacement behaviors in the form of training. Um, good morning, Ray. Happy Memorial Day. Um, I'm working very heavily with the lemurs right now. Here's Dill, and there's a reason we're getting her on the scale weekly, and I'm teaching her to target to my hands and stand up and lift. I have another photo, but I don't believe I posted it here um, of her standing up tall on the scale, reaching my hands so I can prepare for a vet veterinary exam right around her belly. Um, so we're doing a lot of different things with, um, the lemurs and I'm starting to work with a new ring-tailed lemur, Charlie. So when I first start working with an animal and this was happening yesterday, somebody was asking me these questions while they were watching me train the lemurs. They were asking, um, do you ever train an animal that you're nervous about? I'm like, Oh mm -hmm. yeah, I do. Um, and they're like, do you ever get in scary situations? Not if I can help it, because if I'm nervous, it means I don't have enough information about that animal. And if the animals that I'm working with are in closures, so their options are, they don't have as many options. Um, so I don't want to put them in nervous situations. If I'm not the only one working with them, and you know, if an animal can see, hear, smell, or feel us, feel us, you're training it, whether you realize it or not. Um, every keeper that goes in with that animal, if they're going in to clean an enclosure, you are training that animal, whether you realize it or not. The key question is, what are you training it to do? I'm smiling at Teresa's um, comment. Possibly. We're getting ready. We're watching. Um, so if I'm nervous about an animal, the animals in an enclosure, they have less, less options than I do. I don't want to make them nervous. And people start, I hear a lot of things like people saying the animal's unpredictable. If the animal's unpredictable, it means your approach is unpredictable. Uh, there's a lot of variety in who's interacting with the animal, how 
they're interacting with the animal. So I want an animal to be extremely comfortable with me. And if I don't understand that animal, I start working with it at a comfortable distance um, outside the enclosure so I can, you know, target train. And at the same time, whether I'm targeting their hands, their nose, their beak, their back feet, the rear end, I am watching all the other behaviors happening on their an, on that animal. What does its eyes look like? If they have ears, what, how are they holding their ears? Is the fur or the feather um, coming up on the back of their neck at the base of their, um, by the base of their tail? I'm watching all of that when I'm target training. That's when I start understanding what an animal looks like when it's comfortable. What does comfortable mean? Calm, relaxed. Um, so that's how I start understanding animals. And then pending on the animal, I will move from off contact to protective contact to free contact if it allows me. Um, Bruce, the American alligator that we've been working, one of 16 American alligators that I've been working with, um, we are teaching him and he's, he's done. He's ready for the next step. And those of you that have followed the work that I do this, we're live streaming in level two as well. Um, we did start live streaming, um, in level one on understanding what curiosity looks like. You guys know, I always say, um, don't punish curiosity. Don't punish an animal's curiosity by moving the animal past its comfort level, because if you start moving it past its com comfort level, you will positively punish that curiosity. And when you have a curious animal, the sky's the limit. You, I am gathering that animal's reinforcers when I see positive reinforcers when I see a curious animal. And those are all tools I put in my toolbox for future use. Um, so Bruce has come so far. All we want for Bruce is for him to be empowered, to be comfortable with his environment and to be an educator to the public. Um, so what we've done is built a temporary platform with these sm small 18 inch walls around this platform. So what I'm teaching him to do is we want him to come out of his enclosure. We're going to start this week on building a bigger enclosure, uh, but I need him to return to this pond every night. How, this is why I teach an animal, before I get an animal out of an enclosure, I teach it how I'm going to, how to go back. So I don't have to do all this beautiful training throughout the day and build this great relationship with the animal and then punish it at the end of the day by having to capture it. And Bruce, when he first came to us back in February, he was very fearful of hands, fearful of people, not any longer. Um, he is ready for that door to be opened and he wants um, to start working. So what we've done is we've built this temporary platform to teach him to turn around and go back into that enclosure. And he's got it down pat. I text uh, Lindsay last week and said, Bruce is ready for the next step. We, we got to get moving on his enclosure. Um, so you're going to see that happening this week. Um, Lisa says it is, is it ever too late to train? No, I'm going to tell you that right now. No, absolutely not. You can teach an old do dog new tricks. Um, some of the animals I work with are 50, 60 years old. They have a history of reinforcement of desired, undesired behavior, 50, 60 years before I get to them. And I move in and start retraining. So don't ever think an animal's too old to train because if it can see, hear, smell, or feel us, we're training it whether we realize it or not. And it's extremely important. And our responsibility as an air ca animal caretaker to empower the hell out of their lives. Um, and I do that through training and I do that through providing different types of enrichment when I'm not around. Lisa says, I was at a zoo last week and they have 40 plus year old macaws they were indoor cages, birds, and they don't fly. They now put them outside in an aviary they can't use. They look terrified. They say they're starting to walk them about, etc. Is that a good thing or too much? 
Um, I don't want to see a terrified anything. I don't want to see a terrified human. I don't want to see a terrified animal. Um, so I know if these animals are 40 plus years old, if they've never been outside, um, that can be a very fearful thing. And that's called flooding. And I stay away from flooding as much as possible. And flooding is showing an animal a feared object without any opportunity to escape. I do not want to do that. Number one, it's not humane for the animal. Number two, I know better, so I don't have to do that. I will shape that behavior. I want the animal to be empowered and comfortable. And if we have a terrified animal on exhibit, that sends a not a good message to the public. Um, I want to show that we are responsible, um, caring for these animals, wanting to provide a healthy environment for these animals um, because we care, you know, and when we know better, we do better. So absolutely not is never too old. There's no animal too old to train. Um, so we're speaking of fear. Um, we're working with Lillier. Um, he is a red shouldered hawk at the Center for Training um, from Nature's Nursery Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. Um, they contacted me asking me if I would train this hawk. I said, absolutely. That's why his enclosure is covered in sheets and he is becoming so empowered and it's so rewarding to me to see this transformation. So uh, yesterday I posted his calls. Um, we covered his enclosure with sheets because he's coming into a new environment. We wanted him to be very comfortable. So the only thing, uh, and this is shaping, like with these macaws at the zoo that you mentioned, Lisa, this is shaping, okay? We want the animal to be as comfortable as possible. If I'm working with a fearful animal pending, um, I focus on the individual animal. So we set it up. You can see the sheet on the bottom of his cage. Um, we pull that out from the outside so we don't have to get inside and scare him. And um, we are slowly uncovering his cage. Last night, you can see that bright sunlight coming through that back window. I mean, we're so far at uncovering his cage. He's getting ready to see that window. Now, when he sees that window, he's going to see keepers driving by. Um, he's going to see me outside planting. Um, so I need to make sure he's comfortable with that. And I started uncovering him by that window yesterday morning so I could observe him all day. Which perch is he on? Because he's if he's if he's still fearful, if he's fearful of those windows, he's going to perch right where he's at. If he's not fearful of those windows, he's going to perch back there in that far corner. And that is where I did see him yesterday. So Lily is, we're training her to fly to the glove. Um, I'm currently training her to fly to the glove, stay on the glove, eat on the glove. Um, and he, he, not she, um, he's coming a long way. Uh, the only the other things I need to train him before he goes back to nature's nursery is to step on a scale. We're going to start with that next and to um, go into a crate. All right. So this is something I started working on this week. Um, this. So you'll see why I was out on the front porch at 1030 at night and next, but, um, you, those that follow the work that I do know that I put my Rottweiler Quincy down in November. Um, this is Levi, our uh, deaf bulldog, old English bulldog, and he was born deaf. Um, Levi and Quincy bonded and they were both almost the same age, a couple months apart. And Quincy was Levi's ears. Okay. So it's summertime. I'm starting to spend more time on the deck and on the front porch. I asked Levi to come out with me. When I put Quincy down, Levi just shut down. He broke down and it broke my heart. Um, he stayed on the couch. He wouldn't get off the couch. And he did that for a couple of months. Um, 
So now I'm trying to empower him by bringing him back out onto the porch. But as I was out working around on the porch and around the porch, Levi, if you guys remember all the photos I posted last year, used to lay on the front of that porch right before those steps. And he would lay with his butt touching Quincy because she was his ears. And if he moved, if she moved, he would feel it and he would turn around and look. I've, I've seen that behavior of him doing that by himself this year punished. He, does, he, he won't lay there anymore. And I was out watering some flowers and I turned around and looked at him and this is what he's doing. He's hiding. Um, so it shows me he's not comfortable. And I was like, shame on me. I'm sorry. So I'm starting to work with Levi and empower him. He's a fabulous walk dog because I've trained him from such a young age to walk loosely on a leash. So I'm going to start taking him to parks. I'm going to start doing a lot of things. And Levi will turn 10 years old this October. So um, one of the last things I want to talk about, which is extremely important to me and to the care of my animals, um, all of the animals, this is why I was outside. Um, I'm starting to grow a lot of our own flowers and um, fruit bearing plants for our animals because um, I know I spoke to a doctor about this, a human doctor, and he said, be careful with your fruits because they have soft skin and they absorb the um, herbicides and pesticides that people spray on them. And that is what most easily gets absorbed into our body. And I just sat there and I thought about it and I was like, well, I started putting it into action for my animals first before me. And that's because that's just what I do. But we're starting to grow a lot of our own flowers. We're starting to grow a lot of our own fruits and vegetables. This is um, a photo posted um, and made by Dr. Jason Crean that he posted in his avian raw whole feeding um, nutrition group. I don't care if he's just talking about birds. Um, his information is relevant across the species. So we're starting to grow a lot of these flowers for lemurs, um, sloths, for the birds, for us. I want this to be able to be, you know, for all the volunteers and employees to be able to eat these as well. So I started planting a bunch of snapdragons and that's what I was doing on the front porch at 1030 at night with Levi the other day. Um, so we can start feeding these to the animals. We started um, doing microgreens, which I'm not really impressed with. <laughs> As Deb and I were talking yesterday, not really impressed with the whole microgreen process. So I may switch ears, um, but I wanted to try it and I'm going to try different. It's, it's a lot of work, um, but it's not going to stop me from trying to eat healthier and provide healthier foods for my animals. Uh, we did start growing our own strawberries because my doctor told me your berries watch your berries because those are the ones that are going to absorb the herbicides and pesticides real easily. So I'm just like, stop. I don't want any more toxins going into my, my animals bodies, um, that I just wasn't aware of. Um, I don't trust the name organic cause I know there's loopholes that they can get through. So I will know better when I do better and I will do better by growing as much as I can myself, um, which is going to be a lot more work, but we bought these, um, strawberries and we're getting ready to replant and, um, the birds love the strawberries. So they're starting to generate fruit. Um, Sylvia says, yum, we have a sprout farm in our town. Good. I'm looking into other options, how to make this I need to train and grow my own stuff at the same time. Um, so we're preparing all the yard around the center for ways to grow a lot of what we can. Um, and this is another something else we're taking action on. And I posted this in the parrot project. I'm getting rid of all of our plastic containers. Um, 
and last week, I mean, our food sits in these plastic containers and absorbs the toxins from the plastic in which they're sitting. I'm trying very hard to get away from plastic and it's very hard to do it because everything is plastic, but we all wonder why, where, why are we getting cancer? Where is this coming from? Um, my dad, my dad taught me at a very young age, don't ever heat anything in plastic. So we're switching to all glass dishes. I've switched to these because I was concerned about stacking glass dishes and it chipping and chipping into the food that we're giving the animals. So I picked this particular brand because they've got that rubber seal around the edge that protects it from chipping. Um, and just no better do better guys. Our lives are too short. There's not enough, not enough time for um, us to do as, for me to do as much as I want to do. Um, and that's why I have brought on Dr. Jason Crean. He is coming live into the Parrot Project on, I believe it's a Tuesday, June 6th, to talk about teas and how we can use teas for ourselves and our animals. We're already using teas for the birds. We're using teas for the lemurs. Um to help prevent medical issues, um, to help with current medical issues. Um, and you can find that on our website at the Animal Behavior Center, where you can also find our workshops. If you've never attended one of our workshops, you should seriously think about it because I'm putting you to work. I'm putting you to work training and because you understand more, you can be as book smart as you want. But if you are not um, putting that information to work, you're missing over more than 50 percent of understanding. So in our workshops, I stand beside you. I tell you what we're going to do. I tell you to train it and I help you. I guide you. I'll stand up and train. I help you understand the laws of behavior and how to get the behaviors you're trying to get. We also, this is what we do in our online memberships, level one and level two, which you're gonna start seeing some changes to. This is also what we do in our projects, which our projects are species specific. Um, you can also find, Sherman says, I learned so much. Sherman, it was great meeting you. It was great having you at that workshop. That workshop is, going to happen again in May. Um, and Sylvia, yes, I did see you signed up for the zoo workshop in July. Um, I'm excited to have you get ready. I know I've trained with you numerous times before, and I'm looking forward to all working with you in all the different species of animals. So we also have our webinars on our Facebook or not on our website, um, which are recordings you can listen to depending on whatever species, or if you want to learn more about a certain um, area of behavior, just understanding the laws of behavior, we have those too. And uh, we're scheduling another live streamed webinar. Right, Therese? Okay. With that being said, thank you for attending. I'll see you next Sunday because the amazing Samantha Saren is coming on with me next Sunday on Coffee with the Critters, and we will be starting at 9 a.m. We've already discussed a topic. I was talking to her the other day, and that is brain candy for me. I love listening to her talk. She has her master's, um, and she's a board-certified behavior analyst. All right, so I will see you guys next Sunday at 9 a.m. Take care, everybody. Happy Memorial Day.